So I was looking at stuff about the moon. I came across this little <laughs> report. Ancient igneous intrusions and early expansion of the moon revealed by grail gravity gradiometry. All right, so I'm going to decode this for you, but let's just read the first part. The earliest history of the moon is poorly preserved in the surface geologic record because of the high flux of impactors, of which none have ever been seen. But aspects of that, quote, history may be preserved in subsurface structures. Interesting. Application of gravity gradiometry to observations by the Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory mission results in the identification of the population of linear gravity anomalies with lengths of hundreds of kilometers. Inversion of the gravity anomalies indicates elongated positive density anomalies interpreted to be ancient vertical tabular intrusions, or dikes, with an I, formed by magmatism in combination with the extension of the lithosphere. Cross-cutting relationships support a pre-nectarian to nectarian age preceding the end of the heavy bombardment of the moon. Hmm. Interesting that they break it up that way. The distribution, orientation, and dimensions of the intrusions indicated globally <laughs> isotropic exten... <laughs> what is that word? Extensional stress state arising from an increase in the moon's radius by 0 0.6 to 4.9 kilometers early in lunar history. <laughs> history. Consistent with predictions of thermal models. Oh, I'm sure. And I'll break this down so you can understand what they're saying and what's bullcrap and what's not. Planetary gravity analyses have been limited historically to large-scale features associated with high contrast and density because of the low resolution and low signal-to-noise ratio of the data. Nah. As a result, small-scale subsurface structures such as faults or dikes with an eye that have been inferred from their surface expressions have not been resolved in the gravity field and structures lacking a direct surface manifestation have been largely undocumented. This situation has posed a challenge for studies of the early evolution of the moon because the near saturation of the surface by impact craters has erased much of the geological record from the first eh, 700 million years MYR, of lunar, quote, history, ping, spanning the critical period of time between the solidification of the lunar magma ocean, ocean and the end of major impact basins, basin formation. Eh, about 3.8 billion years ago. Gah. Data, from <laughs> data from the Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory. Oh, grail. Grail. Mission now permit, that was a Monty Python movie, Grail Mission. Now permit the expansion of the gravity field to spherical harmonic degree and order 420 model GL0420A, corresponding to a half wavelength resolution of about 13 kilometers at the lunar surface. And I'll, I'll explain this in a minute. This resolution is sufficient to resolve short wavelength density anomalies, such as intrusions having a higher density than the surrounding rocks and faults that offset layers of differing density. In other words, if gravity is supposed to be the way they say it's supposed to be when they look closely at the craters up there, they see that the craters ain't behaving the way they're supposed to behave, and it shows that there's some kind of anomalies and it is showing some kind of subterranean subsurface structure on the moon that they don't know about but they're going to explain it and it's got something to do with canals and channels and dikes which I thought to be quite interesting because because remember all the talk in in the old literature from the 19th century and before about canals on Mars, canals on the moon, canals and, and people paddling down gondolas on canals on Mars and the moon. You know all that stuff. 
Is it the holy grail of science? Well, here we apply the technique of gravity, gradiometry, to the grail gravity field, using second spatial derivatives of the gravitational potential to highlight short wavelength features, quote, short, they're not short wavelength, features associated with discrete structures. Discrete, psst, hey, structures, psst, hey, discrete, keep it, keep it on the down low, the structures. In terrestrial applications, gradients are typically measured directly by a three-axis gradiometry or an aerial or satellite-borne platform. <clears throat> but here, the gradients were calculated from the potential field. In order to emphasize subsurface structures, we used gradients of the Bouger potential, calculated as the difference between the measured gravitational potential and the potential arising from the effects of topography. The maximum amplitude of the second horizontal derivative of the Borger potential at each point on the surface. Uh, and they give the equation measured in Eltvils, where 1e e equals 10 to the negative ninth s to the negative second power was then calculated. The resulting horizontal Borger gradient map displays a rich array of short wavelength structures in the lunar crust. In other words, they mapped out what has to be down there if things were supposed to fall evenly and they didn't. They took the difference and then they just made like a, 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 a like an altitude negative print, like a reverse reverse like imprint of it and model it out on the computer and we'll take a look at that. I haven't even seen it yet. It'd be interesting. The dominant features of the gradient map are the ring structures surrounding the large impact basins. These rings are also observed in the Bouger gravity, but they are resolved in the gradient map as discrete structures. Outside the basins, a large number of irregular small anomalies are observed with typical values of plus or minus 10 E, likely arising from small scale density anomalies in the upper crust associated with variations in composition or porosity. In addition, a number of elongated Linear gravity anomalies, LGA, like the LPGA, speaking of dikes, characterized by <laughs> negative gradients stand out in, stand out clearly above the background variability. Four of the P LGAs have lengths exceeding 500 kilometers. These anomalies closely follow linear paths, great circles across the surface to within root mean square, RMS. Deviations of 1 to 3% of their lengths. Inspection of the most distinct P LGAs yields 22 probable anomalies with a combined length of 5,300 5, kilometers. Yeah, right. And an additional 44 possible anomalies with a combined length of 8,160 kilometers for a total length of 13,460 kilometers. An independent automated algorithm identified 46 anomalies with a combined length of 10,600 kilometers. Such remarkably linear structures in natural geologic systems are typically associated with faults or dikes with an eye. Average profiles of the Borger gravity anomaly per perpendicular to the lineations show them to be associated with narrow positive gravity anomalies, indicating subsurface structures increased density of increased density, rather consistent with the interpretation that the features are mafic igneous intrusions. We used a Monte Carlo gambling approach to invert the average Bourgeois gravity profiles across the PLGAs for the physical properties of the subsurface density anomalies, treating them as tabular bodies of unknown top depth, bottom depth, width, and density contrast. So blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's just take a look and see what, what they came up with because they don't know what they're looking at, but there's something down there in that. <laughs> and it, for mafic intrusions, this low viscosity contrast would require either a particular crystalline intrusion or a highly ductile or partially molten host rock. So they gotta explain it with all this stuff. The source of the gravity anomalies may be analogous to the Great Dyke of Zimbabwe. <laughs> Are they sure that's a geologic structure they are told about? These are scientist nerds, after all, which likely formed as a result of shallow intrusive activity <laughs> during ancient rifting. <laughs> 
This elongated layered ultra mafic intrusion measures 550 kilometers in length. See, I knew they were going to talk about Mars. <laughs> Intrusive bodies of similar scale have been inferred to exist beneath the Valles Marineris region of Mars on the basis of collapse features formed in response to lithospheric extension and intrusion. Alternatively, narrow swarms of closely spaced dikes can be found or can match the gravity anomalies that require tens to hundreds of dikes with an eye confined within zones less than 40 kilometers wide that extend over distances of hundreds of kilometers it's like a like a like a really huge biker gang hi hi <laughs> i really like your dike bike Similar narrow dike swarms <laughs> with lengths up to 100 kilometers formed above elongated axial magma chambers in rifts on Earth. And I can show those here. A, a combination of the above processes may be responsible for the anomalies with this. Okay, so they just try to explain it, but whatever. That and and seven dollars will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Let me talk about what must be going on under the surface. With these lunar dikes with an eye, actually. Previously, so. Okay, so let's just let's just take a look at what it what it looks like. What's it look like? Where's the map? Let's see it. And the data. So, what do we have? It's uh, so they map it out in the Mercator style. And so the moon has this um, subsurface. Let's see what they have to say here. Global mapping of the linear gravity anomalies overlaying on a muted Bourgeois gradient map. The anomalies are classified as probable black lines or possible gray lines. So you want to look at the black lines. Those are the so that's the original map, like of the service, and then. So the, so what they have, are these canals or. Dikes, <laughs> so. I don't know how straight they would be on a normal map. This is a really weird, like rectangular map. Pac-Man map. It's interesting. So what are these straight lines doing there when everything on the surface is like concentric circles? Because I think it's, they're not impact craters. They're like uh, bubble, popped bubbles, you know, like paint defects when you have bubbling, you know. They're very kind of straight lines where it, Basically, where it's dipping down more than it should from whatever th they call it the bombardment, you know, uh, because they say it was all bombarded. But that, to me, it looks like paint defects. It's just like when they say the moon is cheese, whatever, like Swiss cheese, that's so, it's the most ridiculous thing that tells you it's probably more correct than anything. So, Swiss cheese, it has these bubbles, these hollows, you know. It's like a sponge. It looks more like that. Is a sponge a record of millions of years of impacts? Is Swiss cheese a record of millions of years of impacts? No. In the same way, the moon is not record, a record of millions of years of impacts. You know. So that's about it. Uh, so what's the big deal? Well, because they're using long wavelengths to map 
the subsurface underneath. In, in a roundabout way, they're talking about gravity, but really what they're doing is just like infrared can penetrate through clouds and stuff, this is penetrating more with the longer wavelengths. And so they can do that and see what lies underneath. In the 19th century, is in the middle of the century, uh, and looking at a, a heated debate that erupted about whether or not extraterrestrial life existed. So Lowell has developed a complete planetary theory that takes into account not just astronomy, what we're seeing, and he argued vociferously that this is what he saw. This was not a fantasy, he wasn't making this up. He argued that at the eyepiece, one saw these straight canals. From an aristocratic family, he became obsessed with Mars. He built his own observatory. He equipped it with a huge telescope. And in his rendering of Mars, the only water on the planet is trapped in its polar caps. And so the Martians have come up with an ingenious solution, a network of canals that are really canals in that they are man-made waterways and they are used for channeling the meltwater from the polar caps to the warmer equatorial regions where the Martians live and grow their crops. And so what you're seeing in the dark lines is not the water itself, it's the crops that the Martians are growing next to the water. <coughs> it was again an analogy between Earth and Mars. Lowell has this wonderful phrase, we know how other bodies look to us, but we ignore how we look to them. It is not so easy to see ourselves as others see us. <coughs> this wonderful picture which he puts in his book, that's Hyde Park as he took a picture of it from a hot air balloon. <coughs> On our own world we are able only to study our present and our past, in Mars we are able to glimpse in some sort our future. So, the question then becomes, what is happening here on Mars? Why is this the kind of theory, the kind of idea that might have valency in the late 19th century? Well, as a historian, it behoves me to argue for a more contextual account than simply Lowell looked through his telescope and saw this. And this, of course, is reflected in the news and the positive way in which Mars is portrayed. So we have here... Martians build two immense canals in two years. This is a wonderful quote from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. And so the Lowellites reason, necessity being the mother of invention, the Martians dug the huge canals. If there are powerful telescopes on Mars, they're smiling frequently perhaps over all the fuss and bother this country is making and digging in their eyes a mere little trench across the isthmus of Panama. <laughs>
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Brun donated her globes to various observatories and institutions and shared them with experts in the field. In 1915, Lowell himself declared her efforts a capital piece of work, although he almost didn't receive his globe, since the custom officers were suspicious that it was a disguised bomb. They find that there are these canals, these lines, these dikes. Isn't it amazing that that's in the literature about Mars and the moon from way back? So this came up right away when I started looking at, because I heard, you know, there's not much written about the moon. It's almost like it didn't exist the way it does today. It's not described in Mars. And you go back and you look at how it's described. They're talking about canals, canals, you know, like Venice, like, like every city had back then. Every city here had canals. So they looked up, they saw them. What, what it must have looked like at that time. And yes, they had telescopes, the biggest telescope ever made. That was, in, I think, one of the biggest telescopes that has ever been made, which actually pushes optics to the very limit of magnification, is this 90-foot uh, or 60 or 90-foot long telescope that was in the 1883 Columbia World Exposition that was made by somebody it's got kind of sketch origins and it just appears at the 1893 chicago world exposition columbian exposition it just appears there and ended up in the university you're not allowed to look through it and like nope nobody's looking through it i think it's still in some observatory but even like at the griffith observatory they have an optical telescope but what they show you are digitized images but way back for how many centuries, I don't know. That I know the history has an answer, but I don't believe it. They had telescopes. And when they looked and they saw what they saw, and they may have looked at different non-visible wavelengths like this is doing here, they mapped out what they described as canals. So I find it interesting. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks for listening. Thank you.